for all of the, the late comers. Oh, yep. And we all have to accept this. I forgot. Okay. I'm not going to try any of the weird AI things <laughs> <laughs> with the camera. Um, good evening. My name is Tara Youngberg, and I am the manager of the Stamp Gallery at the University of Maryland, as well as the advisor for the Contemporary Art Purchasing Program. Um, and um, I'd like to welcome you to the first of a series of artist talks, part of the, the kind of Stamp Gallery's New Arrivals 2021 exhibition, which is showcasing the seven new acquisitions um, in the um, contemporary Art Purchasing Program here in the Student Union. The CAP program is really amazing. A group of students spends a year researching about artwork, learning about pieces, um, visiting galleries and artist studios, and then selecting pieces that are purchased as part of the union's permanent collection. Um, and so this year, we, we did have a reduced budget um, due to the pandemic, and the, the, the committee was really kind of cautious and selective with their, with their choices. Um, they wanted to highlight artists first, artists of the region. And um, yeah, and so our, our first artist for this talk is um, Kay Ito, whose piece Under My Skin Number One has been, has been included in the collection. Uh, Kay Ito is a visual artist working um, primarily with cameraless photography and installation. Um, he is currently teaching at the International Center for, Photo for Photography um, in New York City. He's received his BFA from the Rochester Institute of Technology um, and his MFA from MICA, the Maryland Institute, or, yeah, Maryland Institute of College of Art. <laughs> um, Ito's work addresses issues of deep intergenerational trauma and connections as he explores the materiality and experimental processes of photography. Um, specifically, the idea around visualizing the invisible, such as radiation, memory, life, death, um, and life or death. Um, Ido was the recipient of the 2020 Marva and John Warnock Biennial Artist Award, the Artist in Residence Award. And he's participated in other residences such as Nas Milka, Center for Fine Photography, um, CPW and the Creative Alliance, which um, residency we just finished up uh, this past month, I believe, with a uh, exhibition. And um, he's been placed in major collections, including the Museum of Contemporary, Chicago, or Contemporary Photography in Chicago, Norton Museum of Art, um, the Candela Collection, and the California Institute of Integral Studies. Um, and he's been reviewed widely in Washington Post, Hyperallergic, uh, Chicago Magazine, Be More Art, um, and BBC Culture Art. Um, I really look forward to hearing, like the CAP committee, one of the things they really wanted to do as part of this was highlight the work of the artists um, in the collection through things such as this artist talk, which will be recorded and posted on the gallery's website afterwards. Um, for folks to reference since we're all in a very hybrid modality. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Kay will give a talk and there'll be time for questions and answers at the end. If you put them in the chat, the gallery um, staff will either voice them or unmute you for the questions. Or for those of us in person in the space, you'll be able to raise your hands at the end. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, since it's a smaller group, um, if you have any question, just let me know. Uh, I can pause in the middle and respond to any of the question you guys have or wait till end either what works for me um okay let me share the screen can everyone see the screen good perfect <clears throat> let me put the eyeglasses on <clears throat> so as uh, tara mentioned i'm a visual artist living in baltimore working and making in um used to be a creative alliance, uh, but my residency ended recently. So I moved to somewhere uh, within the Baltimore. And this is my studio here in the background. Um, so I mainly utilize cameraless photography, uh, which is simply, instead of making imagery with the camera, I use experimental darkroom technique 
to create my, my artwork. Um, or rather, I like to call it using a most essential and basic component aspect of photography, light and shadow, to create artwork. And I also consider myself as an installation artist as well. My work explores the theme of intergenerational trauma rooted in the nuclear weapons and what it means to me to be in the United States as an immigrant or a third generation airborne victim. I challenge the idea of photography as a medium and through the process. I create work that visualize the invisible such as radiation, memory, and the liminal space between life and death. Before I can get to the in detail of the individual artwork, I must talk about the origin of my nuclear trauma, my grandfather. So my grandfather, seen here, uh, Takeshi Ito was a high school student when he witnessed the great tragedy that destroyed nearly everything in Hiroshima. He survived the bombing, yet he lost many of his family members from the explosion and radiation poisoning. After fleeing from Hiroshima, he became a college professor and a profound anti-nuclear activist who established much support for airborne victim, uh, like support for airborne victims such as healthcare systems specifically designed for the airborne victim um, illness and the cancer. As an activist and author, my grandfather fought against the use of nuclear weaponry throughout his life until he too passed away when I was nine years old. I don't remember much of him telling me about his experience in Hiroshima and all of the suffering it followed. And I now regret not asking these questions. However, I do remember him telling me that the day in Hiroshima was like hundreds of suns lighting up the sky. This statement of hundreds of suns haunted my childhood and even until today. So the first and origin of my irradiated artistic journey is sun gazing series. Everything sort of started from this project, which I made during my grad school at MICA. In order to express the connection between the sun and my family history regarding the grandfather's statement, hundreds of sun lighting up the sky, I started to create an annual edition of either 108 prints or 200 foot long scroll every year which can be seen here. These are made by exposing type C photographic paper to sunlight, timed by the duration of my breath. The image on the prints and scroll directly influenced by my breath. In the darkened room, I pull the paper in front of the small aperture that let in the, some of the sun, sunlight from outside to come into the studio to expose the paper to the light while inhaling and kind of like a moving along with my breath, thus resulting in the image that is directly influenced by both the strength of the sunlight and the length of each breath. So I, I repeated this act 408 times, uh, which is a number echoing the ritualistic significance in Japanese Buddhism and my childhood. Throughout New Year's Eve, to New Year's Day, all of the Japanese temple strikes human-sized bell 108 times to rid us of our evil passions and desire and to qualify our soul, which sometimes can be seen as act of redemption. This idea of re redemption has a huge theme in my artwork. The number 108 became a motif in my art making, along with use of sunlight. The whole process of creating these prints became a ritualistic image making. The mark of atomic blast upon my grandfather's life, upon his breath, was passed on to me. And you can see it as the shadow of this print. The research, both personal and academic research, is a large component of my art making. 
um, particularly our IFU witnessed, which is a project I created, uh, the one Tara mentioned earlier, a Marva and John, John Wanak artist in residency at University of Utah is a great example of this practice. This work expands the idea of nuclear trauma, not only to my own Japanese heritage, but also to the often forgotten American nuclear weapon victim, Downwinders. So during the Cold War, the US government con conducted 1,054 nuclear testing across the nation, not any other country on US soil. Most of the testing took place in Nevada, Utah, in New Mexico. Most of the civilians and sometimes even the military official living near the testing site were unaware, uninformed about the de deadly and invisible threat of radiation. Many of them died from cancer or leukemia, and the ones who survived are still fighting for recognition, ap apologies, and support from the government even today. So during my residency, I was given the access to many archives related to downwinders at the, uh, what was the name of the library? Marriott Library at the University of Utah, which I used to create uh, I've Witness, which is a collection of C print photographs depicting 108 eyes, which 100, 108 is a recurring theme in my artwork. Um, this includes the eye of 54 American downwinders and 54 eyes of Japanese airborne victims from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The original image were curated from archive and books, video interviews, and even the image I gathered from my own family album. I again used the sunlight to expose these images lead to light sensitive papers. I then mixed up the processed prints before installing it to the wall, making it unclear on uh, which one is a Japanese and which one is a US victim, which reflect my belief of nuclear weapon affect everybody to same no matter what their nationalities. As they collectively stare back at us, their eyes became a monument of nameless atomic testimonies. To me, these I ask us a question of, can we learn from the past or we too going to join the monument as a witness of the nuclear light? Um, so there's always a tension between, so many people think my artwork is all about history and the past, but in reality, what I'm trying to make work about is the condition of today by reflecting upon what is happening or what has happened and not to repeat. The question of can we learn from the past is uh, kind of like a big theme in my artwork. So as you can see in my previous projects I already shown, uh, many of my artwork focus on bridging the uh, separation of conflict, trauma, and culture. And this is most evident in the works I make with my collaborator, Andrew Paul Kuiper, who is a so fantastic sound artist, who is actually in the background right now. <laughs> um, uh, this collaboration is particularly significant um, because, oh, where did my thing go. Hold on. Ah. Uh, this collaboration is uh, particularly significant due to the fact that Kuiper's grandfather was an engineer who worked on building the uh, Hiroshima atomic bomb in the government operation commonly known as the Manhattan Project. Thus, the bomb his grandfather produced was inflicted upon my grandfather. But our grandfathers were once on the opposite side of the conflict, yet we are now great friends, helping each other to explore, understand, and heal the trauma of nuclear weapons. The most known and the largest project we worked on together is called After Image Requiem, 
um, which is a large scale visual and sound installation containing 108 human scale photograms and four channel sound work made by Kuiper. Uh, where the sound component portrayed a bomb's production created with recording he took at the atomic heritage site, such as New Mexico and Chicago. This particular piece was exhibited in several different ways, depending on the space. Uh, as you can see in this exhibit, uh, exhibit at the SICA, uh, Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art in North Carolina, uh, where we placed the prints not on the ground, but also on the wall, creating more of like a cathedral feel to it instead of the monument. <clears throat> The original piece was debuted at the Baltimore War Memorial in 2018. Uh, one of the reasons we chose this particular building is if we ever encounter a nuclear attack, say from Russia, um, the, this particular building will be used as a makeshift hospital for triage. Thus, the wounded people and perhaps bodies would be laid on the ground, similar to how these prints are laid on the ground. <clears throat> these C prints were made by exposing the darkroom papers to sunlight, but the same as before, but this time I'm placing my own body on the top or in between the sun and the prints using kind of like myself as a camera. This refers to the engraved people's shadow near Hiroshima and Nagasaki's ground zero. The heat of the explosion was hotter than coal of the sun, vaporizing anyone who's right beneath it, uh, leaving only the shadow on the ground. Um, as you can see it in the left side and the right side. Uh, actually, example of this Hiroshima shadow can be seen at the Hiroshima Peace Museum. Um, which I think I first saw the, 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 the one on the right, they cut off the staircase and actually placed it in a museum when I was five. Um, I still remember seeing it and I didn't quite understand back then, but the idea of the terror and trauma was definitely like something I kind of like understood even to the child's mind. Um, so I specifically used my own body to create these prints as a way to show what I, what I was inherited. The radiation that my grandfather was exposed to pierced through his skin and inscripted itself onto his gene. And later it was passed on to me. Our bodies are now being captured through time and history, film and DNA. And now I am using that inherited light to create these prints. The space was lit by a single spotlight, casting the audience's shadow on my prints. And by seeing their own shadow overlapping my own body of irradiated shadow, the audience will hopefully realize that they are also part of this nuclear legacy of today. As Kuiper's sound plays above in the air, my bodies lay on the ground. Our grandfather's position are echoed in the space, but our stance have changed. And hopefully people can see it as that each print is a prayer for the future. Um, and finally get into the um, the piece that collected by the gallery. Um, the piece is called Burning Away and Under My Skin, uh, which uses the same technique, uh, but kind of like I kind of conjure the same into the same theory. Um, so this project is rooted in specific stories of the aftermath of the bombing. As you can see, like so many of my artworks, it's, it's either influenced by the story or fact or science or many of the things I gather through my personal and academic research 
And this was one of the personal research I did <clears throat> um, regarding the, the, the story of the survivors. <clears throat> the moment the bomb exploded in the sky in Hiroshima, it created a giant fireball reaching the surface temperature of 7,700 degrees Celsius, which is actually a little bit hotter than the core of the sun itself. <clears throat> the heat wave vaporized the people near the ground zero and left devastating burns on, the peop on those who survived and left alive. I found a many story of survivors to treat the burn with honey, cooking oil, and even mortar oil due to the uh, <clears throat> scarcity of the, even the most basic medicine. Um, please don't try it at home because this is our medical field has advanced ever since and this is not the really way to treat the wound anymore. <laughs> but what I was influenced by was how desperate people were to even try to do anything to treat the wound. Um, but also the, the blind, blinding heat was indeed a great threat. But the invisible threat of radiation is what makes nuclear weapon is a truly a devastating weapons. Many of the survivors were unaware of the invisible threat that was implanted within their bodies like a second bomb waiting to go off. It was their children and grandchildren who were witness of the effect of these radiations, such as a form of cancer, which I witnessed my grandfather go through. These stories of desperate measure to heal the physical wound and inescapable threat of radiation and cancer led me to create this project. I decided to use a process called chemigram, uh, which is a sort of like a process combines photographic process and paintings. Uh, I simply painted with a paintbrush and all, uh, painted a sun-fused darkroom paper with honey and various oils mentioned in the previous um, stories I was uh, researching. Um, and I repeatedly dipped them dip the painted paper into the developer and the fixer, kind of like uh, simultaneously um, to create this pattern that uniquely um, respond to the type of oil I applied to the paper. So like the difference between these, um, the shape and pattern and the color is actually comes from the type of the paper, type of the oil, uh, how much of the time I expose these print to the sunlight. Um, I really embrace the imperfection, well, I wouldn't call it imperfection uh, nature, but rather act of God in some extent. Because um, people think photography as such a rigid kind of like, oh, you can control one fifty thousandth of the second to take a picture. But to me, like a photography is not that, it's not based on machine, but it's based on more organic idea. And like, this is one way for me to really approach that aspect of photography as well. Um, so this process uh, creates like really, uh, these prints are pretty big. I think this is uh, 40 by, 24, 48, 16, 72, 90. So 100, 103 by 40 inches print. Um, so it's quite monumental when you stand in front of it. But when you get close to it, there's a hundreds of tiny, tiny like bubble in some extent created by the different kind of oil, kind of creating this microscopic view like um, it might actually remind one of a cancer cells. Um, so it's actually really worked well. And it's something I really think about a lot uh, in terms of making artwork. Why am I using this material? Why am I using this process? Um, instead of just a 
the end result of the artwork, I really think through as a process, as a part of the storytelling to create uh, an artwork. Um, so under my skin, the prints number one, which is the one of the first print I ever made out of this series, which is part of the collection of the stamp gallery right now, which is, I'm really excited about it. Um, I think it, it's always like the first print always have a special place for me. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about that. <clears throat> and again, I don't know how long it's gonna take, but I am aiming to create 108 of them eventually, uh, both the big prints and the smaller prints, or maybe combine both of them 108. Um, but I'm not thinking about like, oh, trying to make it in like a year. Uh, it's gonna be like 10 year project, <laughs> long time. Um, and then luckily, uh, as soon as the, the stamp gallery collected the piece, uh, which one was it? This one actually got collected by a gallery in Richmond, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, Uh, and well, since I'm at it, um, let me briefly talk about the exhibition that Tara mentioned earlier. Um, currently on view right now at the Creative Alliance in Baltimore, which uh, I, I believe it's gonna be on view for next two weeks. And you can only have access to it on Saturday from noon to five or four because of the COVID. <clears throat> So the piece is called Our, called Our Looming Ground Zero, uh, which is the installation consists of, again, 108 uh, framed photographs on the ground, as you can see, uh, juxtaposed with 108 suspended plumb bobs from the ceiling, uh, which is the, this, this black thing from the hanging from the ceiling is called plumb bomb. Uh, the plumb bomb, it, which is a commonly used to level the floor in the construction, uh, which is kind of like to see how level, how flat the ground is, um, kind of echoes the annihilated and flattened land of Hiroshima, which my grandfather witnessed. Uh, he recalled everything, buildings, trees, people, and even his beloved sister who was at the ground zero at the, at the moment that the bomb exploded, were blown away, vaporized, and gone, leaving only the shadow on the ground. <clears throat> so these painted plumb bombs are suspended from the galley ceiling, um, pointing directly to the framed prints. Each photogram contains one ordinary word I kind of like randomly came up with, uh, kind of Dada style, you may call it, um, such as chair, mother, tree, you, me, cup, wedding dress, the, all of the different kind of things. Uh, but collectively, all 108 together creates a grave monument that is made to think that will perish in the light of nuclear explosion. Um, and this is kind of, uh, again, like this is something I created in, not just for the, the meaning of the piece, but also the way for me to break out from the idea of the photography as well. Um, so many times, and this is something I, I don't get to talk about too often, uh, since you know this is more loose artist talk. Uh, I'm gonna just go on and on, so you can stop me if you <laughs> have any questions or anything. But um, the idea of the breaking the boundary is uh, something like I'm interested, but so many contemporary artists also really interested about, like. People like to classify you as like, oh, you are the painter, you are the photographer, and especially photography. People like when I say like, oh, I'm a photographer. People, the first thing people ask is like, oh, do you shoot wedding, or do you shoot, you know, portraiture, or do you what kind of like camera do you use, what kind of lens? And there's like a, this idea of very traditional idea of what photography become. 
Uh, and like, I, I always like say like, no, photography could be a lot more than just framed photograph on the wall. You know, it could create environment. It, cre it could create something more sculptural. And like I push in such a different way, like my way of organic way of like, you know, using my breath, my like sunlight to create these artwork is the one thing I really take a pride, but also something that incorporating like plumb bob or like architecture itself, or I, I incorporate a lot of sound in my artwork. I really think about how to light the piece. And altogether it creates a whole narrative that sometimes it's impossible to convey from the, just a single photograph. Uh, so that's something I really, really enjoy and something I don't get to talk about a lot um, because of the nature of people call me a Hiroshima artist. And a lot of time people focus on that aspect of it. And sometimes, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with it. You know, like that's something that my passion is and that's the reason why I'm making artwork. But also like this idea of like how to break the world of photography and reconstruct it, you know, is something I also really enjoy. Um, so yeah, like hopefully that is kind of like a evident from my uh, artwork. Um, since, uh, you know, we have time, uh, don't think there's, uh, unless if anyone have any like a specific question for me, um, I didn't see the chat. It looks like there's one in the chat, which I'll let oh. Isabel, do you want to read it? Oh, it shut off. Oh, no. Okay. Well, here, I will. Let me read this. Sorry for everyone in the. Oh, in no, the I, I can. I can. I can see it. Okay, good. Oh, bye bye. You, you, you can read it out so yeah. other people can. All right. Yeah, that way. Um, so Matthias says, um, could you tell us more about your process for selecting specific language for the work Loom mm. Zero? I'm imagining possibilities for this process, like lifting these items from your victimology transcripts and your, oops, sorry, I just lost the, and your relationship with the archive that you described earlier. So actually, this is a great question, actually. Um, so when I was thinking of like what word to use, it's originally, I started with kind of like nonsensical, like anything I see, anything that I can think of from my head and just wrote it down kind of the style, but suddenly it kind of hit me to kind of like a reach out to one of the, the book my grandfather wrote, um, which is again, like my grandfather passed away when I was nine, but uh, he was a quite well-known uh, anti-nuclear activist uh, my dad tell me he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize and Mother Teresa took it away. So <laughs> good competition, but um, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's, it's I would like to think that is the case um, anyway. Um, but so my way of learning what my grandfather went through besides my grandfather's statement of hundreds of sons or some of the specific thing, books and uh, the audio interview has been a, such a huge resource for me to essentially the foundation of my art making. And kind of like I extend that idea to so many different things. So like that particular book I actually grew up with because it actually was used as a textbook um, from the 1990 to like a few 10 years or so in elementary school, uh, which, uh, so I, I grew up with reading my grandfather's text and some of the, the statement. And I started pulling specific words from his book and kind of like trying to make a coherent idea and kind of like, so it's kind of like a both random, but also kind of like specifically rooted to the idea that reflect my relationship with my grandfather in some extent and like what I been went through. And this is the piece I made during COVID. Uh, and most of the people 
tend to not realize, but, you know, like most of the people don't think in a way that, oh, nuclear war happens anytime kind of mindset. Uh, I certainly do. Um, so when I think about COVID, it's that's the closest thing we would ever have and had uh, to the Cold War or the nuclear aftermath. This idea of the extreme isolation, the invisible threat, uh, you know, you, you know, that this like a mask mandatory. I'm actually be making artwork uh, with uh, for upcoming exhibit. I I'm using uh, the children's mask from the Soviet era during Cold War. The government issued mask. Uh, and I dissected it to kind of create the contact print, uh, kind of like reflecting the idea of COVID and this idea of like a living, lived experience, not secondhand story given my grandfather, but instead like my firsthand lived experience also influenced to pick some of the words included in uh, the uh, the, the, the piece. And this is kind of like the other thing that I don't get to talk about too often, but I consider every artwork to be my self portrait, every single artwork, because it's always something as uh, some aspect of me in the project. Sometimes it's literal as using my body or my breath or the conceptually like some of the thing that represents my life as well. Um, I recently got married, so wedding dress is in here. Um, so this is kind of like, uh, so it, it, I don't know if it specifically answered uh, the question, but it's kind of like a kind of, kind of roundabout to answer the question. <laughs> I do that a lot. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Hey, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, so the the pieces, including the piece that um, that we have collected um, under my skin, you're you're using um, honey and oil in a really painterly way, how you mm -hmm. described it. And I think like I can see kind of references to Jackson Pollock. And but also I was just curious if you have a specific um, kind of design intent when you're applying these materials mm -hmm. to the paper. Um, like, you know, they do look humanoid, they look like, they look cellular. Um, but yeah, are there things that you're like, are you, yeah, what's like, are you thinking about that as you lay those materials all down? Absolutely. Um, actually, this project I started with um, under my skin, because it's much smaller project, you know, it's, this is uh, 16 by 48 inches. So, you know, it's manageable. It's a smaller piece to experiment with. Uh, so these pieces, I my intent was to create kind of like a, a, a cell, you know, like a DNA, like uh, picture. And like, but it also like kind of like make, made it grotesque because it's the nature of the chemigram. Uh, but I, I've kind of like a really found it beautiful to kind of play with this idea then kind of idea struck in my head that the nuclear issue, especially the form of the cancer, it's both micro, micro and macro. Um, the idea of this nuclear issue is such a huge issue that it's so big that people always forget about it. <laughs> Because like oh it's it it you know like it happens it happens you know like oh let's talk about something you know it's a similar thing with the the climate issue, uh, you know it's such a huge thing that oh like individual doesn't matter the government gonna take care of or we all gonna die, uh, so this kind of attitude is I think applied even more to the nuclear issue I think, um, so I was thinking of like this such a macro of the issue but the effect and the people who suffer is the microscopic, you know, like it's a gene, it's a cancer, and also it's an individual. 
Um, and that hounds through not just the moment the bomb exploded, but it's a long line of suffering and trauma that kind of passed down to the next generation and next generation. So that's why I was like kind of thinking, uh, kind of like a figurative, but more abstracted. And it's, I'm going to tell you, since I'm using honey and uh, oil, it's impossible to make some detailed painting. <laughs> um, so abstraction is a by nature, but I actually embrace it. Uh, I embrace a lot of the thing, and this was one of the, uh, the thing that I was like, this actually could work. Um, so yeah, definitely like, I intend this to be figurative, ghostly figure. Um, and I think these, uh, with these two series kind of combined, kind of like, talk about the whole new narrative to me um and yeah and it's actually kind of like really excited about it um the place i just moved uh for the studio has a the yard which i didn't have back then so i can oh because i use tongue oil which is uh uh kind of like a, a oil that used to finish the like you know polish the wood but it's very, very stinky. <laughs> it, it, some people say it's a really beautiful smell, and I agree. It uh, really has a nice scent to it. But if your clothes get soaked by it, oh, it's a, it's a nightmare. <laughs> uh, if you wash it like five times, it still doesn't come off. Uh, so I needed the, the better ventilation, which is like this place can offer. So I'm, I'm thankful about that. So I, I'll be making a lot, of, lot, lot more of this project and try to promote uh, in the project, which uh, this is the, uh, the solo exhibition that coming up in Philadelphia uh in september so uh, actually my install happens in two weeks uh and i haven't made every print so i need to i need to work on that but um so you know as you can see the sketch but i'm incorporating the the same project in the background uh, in the second room uh because like i think like so many like essentially like it doesn't really matter which work i put because my the base of my artwork or like the story that I try to tell is the same. So like anything really fits, but even that, like I'm trying to weave through to specifically what do I want to talk about uh, through the exhibit. And this one particularly, I want to talk about COVID uh, in relating to the Cold War hysteria or uh, the nuclear issue that does that it has like the, the the mask piece and everything and the name recovery to new existent and recovery to normal existent is came from this uh, booklet that issued in cold during the Cold War and I don't know if you can see it but it says from the left uh, confined in the shelter brief exist so it, it kind of talks about the uh, stage of how to survive the nuclear weapon after the mass of the nuclear weapon and how long it takes to safe to go out and you know going through so many and finally it says recovery to normal existence and that's something we are hoping for for the COVID as well not going back to what it used to be because it's impossible we are finding new normal. We are hoping for the new normal that we can live with this idea of the COVID, be cautious about it, but also can live relatively, you know, happily and you know, not isolated as much as it is right now. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about this project, and yeah, this is something I'm working on. Uh, and there's a few project that's gonna happen in Colorado. Uh, I have a, um, uh, actually, like you mentioned about Masmoka, which is a residency, uh, I encourage any artist to apply. Um, it's actually, I, it hasn't happened yet because it got pushed back because of the COVID. Um, but I will be uh, going there on November to fulfill my residency duty. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. And this is the right, about right time to I think, conclude.
So I actually had one more question. Oh, about, please, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I love that you in, in, um, put in your SketchUp because you <laughs> about the installation stuff. Because I know that a lot of your a lot of them have different installs, and you mentioned that depending on where you're installing it, it can look differently. Mm -hmm. So when you are going to install, like when you walk into a place for the first time and you're looking around, what kind of what what are you trying to evoke with your installation? Like, are you trying to encourage like a like reflection? Are you trying to with the war memorial one? I think you mentioned mm -hmm. like. Um, like the other place had more of a cathedral feel than a memorial feel. So I was just wondering, because I love doing installs and sometimes mm -hmm. I know different kinds of installs can generate different feelings. And since you have very emotional, very um, beautiful, but very evocative um, kind of pieces, I was wondering what you go for with the install. Usually I, like first thing I try to check is how much of the control I can get with the lighting. Uh, is the light, is, is there a window? And if there's a window, can I put the curtain? You know, is the gallery okay with it? And a lot of time I actually bring my own lighting or, you know, collaborate with the collaborator. We, you know, both of us brings the, the light to actually have a, as much of the control as possible because usually the darker space, the more atmospheric it goes. Uh, so I think, it's kind of funny because like I I I've made exhibit outside, I've made exhibit inside, but I always try to control everything, which is kind of funny because like my artwork is about letting go of the control. And in the end, usually that's what happens. I I can't control everything and like let the, the environment like a war memorial is a perfect example. Like I try to fight against the architecture first. You know, but I couldn't, you know, like it exists, it's right there. Yeah. But I finally embraced the space and like you know, kind of played with lighting and it created some kind of more atmospheric space. Instead of just a space, it created some kind of um what is the word for it? The monument. Yeah. I, I consider many of like my large scale piece to be a temporal monument. Uh, and so many times, because like people need to step in, because monument is not about just looking at from afar, it's always about stepping in. Uh, and, you know, like I've been to, you know, like the Korean, Korean, uh, not Vietnam Memorial, it's the, the, the best example, like uh, Maya Lin, she's fucking genius. Um, <laughs> like, seeing the reflection and physically going into the under the ground, you know, that is like such a, you know, it, it's a kind of itself is a ritual like and audience a lot of time doesn't know they are going through the ritual and there's a perfect you know the perfect uh the way to incorporate that like no matter what you think as long as you step into the, the art in installation you became the part of the artwork um so yeah that that's something i can like so to answer your question in a more condensed way I tried to think of how do I incorporate audience into the space without them knowing is <laughs> mm -hmm. a lot of thing I, I okay. think about. Awesome, thank you so much. No, thank you. Perfect. Yeah, thank you so much, Kay. Okay, good, we have one more question, I think, or at least a comment. Let me mm -hmm. walk around and read it. Um, I'm interested in works that challenge national symbols and that ex examine military influence on individuals, the environment, and the inescapable power balance that exists in any war or conflict. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you make your work with an imagined audience in mind, especially as you navigate topics that explore imbalances between nations, military, and civilian populations. It's interesting. Um... So I'm, I'm trying to like a truly like which part of the question I should respond. Um, so I, I don't know if this, this exactly answered the question. Again, like I, I usually go all over the place and trying to kind of give a larger context of like what I think to respond to the question. So 
I apologize in advance if I didn't answer your question, um, but I, I usually think about, um, yes, I do think, uh, wouldn't call it imagined audience, but uh, audience in my mind, uh, a lot of the big thing about like my art making is why am I making this artwork? And through that, like, how do I communicate with artists and how do I communicate with the audience through the artwork to convey, but not being didactic. Uh, and that is the part of the, the photography background. I originally, you know, like taking the picture with the camera, wanted to be a photojournalist. Um, and that's a really didactic way of storytelling. It, it's, it's quite literal, not, not so much these days, but, uh, when we think about news photography, it needs to be didactic. Um, but to me, uh, I'm like, what I was started interested in is how do I incorporate the people from the other end? Uh, the like, the collaboration with Andrew is the the great example of it. Like by myself making work about Hiroshima, it would become victimhood and it's not a victimhood I want to talk about some some work is definitely incorporate that but so many times I want to I want my work to be a platform it want I want to be a bridge making to create kind of um more more conversation as a whole because you can't fix any issue by just talking about one side of the issue you we need to incorporate both sides of the issue so we sometimes actually invite for the Sika exhibit southeastern center for contemporary art we actually invited some of the veteran of the world war ii to talk about their experience in during world war ii and some of them straight up say like you know like oh hate Japanese, <laughs> you know, they're Nazis, <laughs> like, and I get that, but, like, I think, like, acknowledging that and understanding that, and, you know, like, my, myself, my grandfather was an activist, I don't consider myself as an activist, I'm a artist still trying to figure out what was, you know, what is the right, you know, I think the nuclear weapon is wrong if it's going to be ever used in the future, but I'm still in the process of trying to find out and try to learn what my grandfather went through and what many people in that era went through and not to repeat the same mistake again. Um, and in terms of like a different issue of the conflict, I, I talked to a lot of people, uh, um, Korean uh, artists, uh, Middle Eastern artists, who mentioned about the kind of similar thing, like have we ever considered creating work about different conflict? Uh, it's I've I've done a few times, uh, but it always like again like my artwork is so many times is self reflective artwork. I've made work about immigration. I've made work about uh, U.S. internment camp, Japanese internment camp that happened in the West. Um, but so many times, like, it, it still have a connection to my experience. So, like, it feels like if I start making work about something completely non-related to my trauma, then it, it feels like I'm, I don't know, that, that's a kind of like a gray zone that I haven't really comfortable to explore yet, but maybe, because uh, eventually what I really want to explore is the idea of the life and death and kind of like a yeah, as you say, like kind of like navigate the topic, explore the imbalance between nation, militia, you know, militia and civilized, you know, civilian population. It's kind of like what you said is actually what I want to aim for. But right, right now, I'm kind of like uh, sitting in a comfortable place that I can talk about myself and my lived experience and my heritage. Uh, and I don't know if I can ever step up to talk about much a larger issue, but. I certainly gonna aim for. See, like my, it, it's all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much, Kay. I'm really heartbroken because we are out of time. I know it's 7 p.m. and I don't want to hold folks up. Um, 
And I just want to say thank you all for joining us both in here in the Nantico Room and Stamp. And for those of us who are um, on Zoom, thank you so much. This will be recorded and put on the Stamp Gallery's website. Kay, thank you so much for speaking about your work and also um, sharing your creative practice with us and with the University of Maryland community. Uh, New Arrivals 2021 will be on view through October 16th. It's open to the general public. Um, we have a mask mandate in the, in the, at the University of Maryland indoors, but folks can come by and see Kay's work as well as the other acquisitions. Uh, we're open Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and Saturday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and then after this exhibition, the work will be put on view in the stamp on the walls, um, likely over winter or spring break. So hopefully for the spring semester. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Kay. Thank you. Thank you everyone. so much. Have a wonderful evening. I'm